So for this question, we're asked to find how many poles are on the right hand side of the imaginary axis. And we're going to do this using the roost table. So to set up our roost table, we need to look at our uh, highest power of s on the bottom line of our transfer function. And we've got s to the power of 4. So that's going to be the power of the first row. And then we need to go all the way down to s to the power of 0. And make some columns as well. All right, so filling in our um, coefficients. So the coefficient in front of our highest power of s um, is going to be a 1. All right, it's like a 1 s to the fourth. So that's what goes in here. Now we don't have an s to the 3 listed in here. So that would suggest that the uh, coefficient in front of that term is a 0. So that's what we can put here. Next we go up to this cell and we've got an s squared term and the coefficient is 13. So that's what goes here. We don't have an s term on its own, so again, that's going to suggest that the coefficient in front of that term is a 0, so we can put that in. And we've got a constant, which is 36, and everything else we know we can label as 0 all the way across, as far as we need. All right, so what we've ended up with here is a uh, situation where we have a row of zeros, and this is one of the special cases um, that we need to deal with. So how we deal with that is we go to the row above the row of zeros, which in this case is our first one, and we write out the polynomial that's associated with it. So since this is the s to the 4 row, this one here is going to be 1s to the 4th. Um, so this one here represents our squared term, so it's 13s squared. And then this one here represents our constant on the end, so it's going to be 36. So this is the polynomial that represents this row. And in fact, um, since it happened in the first row, it's the same as what we got for our denominator. So you do the same kind of thing even if the row of zeros happens down here. So let's pretend there's one that happened here. We would go back to the previous row and we'd write out what the corresponding polynomial was instead there. So it would be something s squared plus this would be your constant. Okay, so that's all it is. So let's say that this is equal to y. What we need to do is take the derivative. So I'll call it y dash. And it's the derivative with respect to s. So the derivative of s to the fourth is going to be 4s to the 3. Derivative here, 2 times 13 is 26. s to the power of 1. And then the constant just drops off. So we end up with new coefficients of 4 and 26. And these can be used now in this row um, to replace the row of zeros. So this is our s cubed um, term. So we'll cross this out and make it a 4 instead. That's the coefficient. And this is our s to the 1, which represents this box here. So we cross it out and make it 26. Okay, um, and we didn't end up with any of the others, but you know there would still be zeros all the way across if you needed to fill them in. All right, so now we can keep going with our roost table. And let's look at what's happening in this box here. Call it A. So we can work out from the determinant what the value is. And I end up with the number 39. This one here we can get fairly easily. So if we need to take the determinant, it's going to be 1, 4, 36, and 0. We know that a pattern occurs when we get a 0 on the um, bottom right of our determinant. All it causes is that this box gets carried down. So this one becomes 36. This one here is going to be a 0 because we have zeros for the two um, right-hand um, elements in our matrix for the determinant as well. All right, so now we should be able to deal with this one here. Let's call it B. So the determinant, again, we're using our replace numbers. And we end up with an answer here of about 22.31. So that gets replaced here. This one is going to end up being a zero since these are both zeros on the right hand side. And this one here again is going to follow the pattern when we have a bottom right hand corner being a zero this element gets transferred down, one above the zero, so it's 36. So the question asked us how many poles we have on the right-hand side of our imaginary axis. 
So all we need to do is count up the number of sign changes we see in the first column. So we go from 1 to 4. These are both positive numbers, so there's not going to be a sign change. 4 to 39, again, they're both positive, so there's no ch sign change. This one here, again, both positive, no sign change. This one here, again, positive, so no sign change. So what this is telling us is that we've got no poles on the right-hand side of the imaginary axis. Okay, so if this was used in a system, it's likely it would be, um, oh, it's going to be a stable, stable system. And I just typed in MATLAB um, to find the roots of our uh, bottom line. These here are the coefficients in front of each of our terms. Um, and this is the answer that MATLAB spits out. So these are where the poles are. And you can see that there's no positive values here for the real component of any of them, um, which again confirms our assumption that there's no poles on the right-hand side of the imaginary axis. In fact, if we were to draw it, so this is the imaginary and this is the real, what we'd find is that all of these are sitting on the imaginary axis. So something like this. Oh, that one's supposed to be on the axis. Okay, there's nothing on the right-hand side here. So therefore, it's going to be a stable system. So that's all there is. See you in another video.